the title of the presentation was a bit of uh, ironic, I guess, because we are perhaps much focused on if serpentinite fluids, of fluids coming from the dehydration of serpentinides are oxidized or not, that maybe we should rephrase the, the question if, if this is really important and what is the actual important question. So let me try to go ahead and, well, just to phrase the, the question is that uh, why the arc magmas are oxidized. And this is something I've been seeing already for a while, that if we look at uh, volcanics and mantle rocks from arcs that are here in this compilation from, from Cotel recently in 2020, we see that independently of the method we use, either like SANES, OXANES, or using classical oxybarometry, the oxygen fugacity conditions that they are recording is significantly high, or at least one log unit higher than would be assumed for MORBs. And this is true apparently all over the world, so it seems to be a quite consistent observation. But the ultimate reason why the oxidized magmas are oxidized uh, is not yet probably solved. And try to go ahead on this. It's not just the oxidation state of arc magmas. So one thing is the oxygen fugacity that I will try to very briefly introduce later, but it's not just this uh, uh, properties, actually the amount of magmas that are produced, that are oxidized, that is, needs to be answered. And the thing is that when we look at the, what is the production rates of, uh, or, or let's say the mantle wedge oxidation rate in arcs, we first will need to look at what are the magma production rates. And the first estimate of argma uh, production rates are probably in the order of one to two uh, cubic kilometers square per year, which is like a 10% of only of the morb. But if you want to translate this into what is the amount of arc or mantle wedge that you need to oxidize in order to produce these magmas, you will translate these values in order, in this order of four to eight uh, cubic uh, kilometers square per year that need to be oxidized in order to produce such magma. And there are some more recent uh, estimates that even duplicate these numbers, so saying that arc magmas can be, or the production rate of magmas in these settings can be even as high as more. So we have really a question of a uh, mass problem here. Uh, there is, of course, a must be a relation between what's happening in subduction and the slab and what is going on in the mantle wedge. And there are people trying to quantify this, these observations by using something that can happen a bit of uh, strange at the beginning, which was introduced by Katie Evans some few years ago, decades already ago, which is related with the redox budget. And what she observed is that when you compile a bunch of data, a bunch of geochemical data, it seems to be a correlation between this number, and I will explain later what is the meaning of this, of this number, and either the age of the subduction zone or the convergence rate or the number of kilometers have been subducted. So in general, we see that is something related with a mass or with a flow from the slab that needs to go into the arcs to produce these oxidized magmas. So it's important here to make up this big difference between what is the redox budget, which is this value here, and what we are normally uh, used to talk with is the oxygen fugacity, which is an intensive variable. Uh, and opposed to a redox budget with an extensive uh, variable. So I'll do my best here to very quickly <laughs> summarize this, which can be perhaps a bit uh, esoteric, but uh, let's try to do it. Uh, what is the, this difference? Okay, so let's start with this um, Gibbs energy diagram for a two component system. So if we fix our composition in terms of, for example, the amount of oxygen in our, in our system in this start, we see that the stable assemblage, which is the minimum Gibbs energy, is consisting of hematite and magnetite. And this assemblage buffer the chemical potential of oxygen. And by definition, this would be the chemical potential of oxygen, which is buffered by hematite and magnetite. Normally, these values have exchange units of, of energy per mole. So people normally re used to report these values using the oxygen, the chemical potential of pure oxygen at one bar, and the 
the difference between these two values is proportional to the oxygen fugacity that most of us are, uh, are familiar with. But then we can also describe what is the people used to say as a red dot budget or whatever it means as an extensive variable that reflects the amount of oxygen in our system. And for that, we can use an arbitrary reference, for instance, this one, magnetite, and the difference between that value and that value will be proportional to this red dot budget. So as a whole, it's trying to reflect not just the fact that we have magnetite hematite, but also the amount of oxygen, which in the case is the amount of magnetite relative to hematite in our system. And this will become important because when we talk about fluids coming from the slab, it's not just important to know the oxygen focacity conditions, but also the oxidation capacity. And this will be controlled by this variable. Okay, so again, to summarize, if we want to constrain the oxidation rate of this mass flow from the from the slab to the mantle wedge, we should probably use these extensive parameters, this red dot budget or reducing capacity from Galvez. So the question uh, we should need to address is that we should look more about if the fluids have a high or a low potential to oxidize the mantle wedge rather than just the oxygen focacity conditions. So the first um, uh, obvious uh, source for oxidizing the mantle wedge is the slab. And because serpentinite, as you might already know, can release a significant amount of fluid, the dehydration of serpentinite is the first candidate to produce perhaps the water and also the oxidized uh, conditions or the oxidizing uh, element that can actually oxidize the mantle wedge. So this was proposed less a few years ago, and since then there's been a very much debate about if this is the case or not. And the arguments uh, against most of this, uh, or the argument against the serpentinite being the source is an apparent contradiction between observations and some experiments and also thermodynamic modeling. So my job today will try to convince you that there's actually no apparent uh, disagreement. And by learning about what is the cause of this disagreement, we can actually go a bit further to understand the whole, the whole picture. Okay, so I think uh, there's no need to say much about this. So we know uh, serpentinization is a process that hydrate peridotite and produce serpentinites. But in detail, this is not just serpentinite, but it also contains magnetite uh, in variable proportions. It produces also gases at reducing conditions and also sulfur in variable state. So now if we ask the question, what will happen during the serpentinization and we reverse the reaction, then we need to ask ourselves, what will be the fate of this magnetite and what will be the fate of this sulfur bearing species? Because they will have an important and strong impact on their release fluids and their oxidation capacity. Okay, so let's uh, summarize here the data we have so far. So this is coming from a large compilation of uh, geochemical data. So we will plot the ferric iron content against the water content. So here, this is our starting point, our depleted mantle source. And what we see is that it's a quite dramatic uh, increase in the ferric over total iron content when we hydrate the, serpent, the, the mantle uh, the, the, the dry mantle. So it seems to follow a kind of a path which I would call hydration, but also oxidation. The same is not true for sulfur. Sulfur uh, is a large variety of sulfur, which is, seems to be quite independent of the amount of uh, hydration. And this is because sulfur itself is quite complicated in terms of redox conditions already during serpentinization. It can be extremely high, extremely low, depending on if you have hydrothermal fluids, if you have a bacteria uh, reduction. So there are many processes of making the, which is a quite random uh, concentration of sulfur against the water. When we look at what's going on during subduction, there are only a few cases where you can understand this and see this in nature. And the only one that we can actually see both the serpentinites and the high pressure dehydrated rocks coming from the serpentinites is coming from from Cerro del Almirez in Spain. And in this particular place, we see both the reactant and the product. And when we look at the 
very current content of this, uh, I will call them like high pressure serpentinites, uh, which are here in red, uh, in this color or these ones. So they have still a high uh, ferric over total iron content. And in terms of sulfur, they're actually much depleted. Um, if we compare these serpentinites, which are the ones which are calcium poor, they have sulfur content which are not that different from the from the depleted mantle uh, source. Um, okay, so now the question is, what will happen when we dehydrate them? And this is an observation. When you look at the more pristine samples with less late weathering, you have a quite dramatic change in the ferric iron content. You go from this 0.6 towards up to 0.3 or 0.2 uh, over the total iron. In terms of uh, sulfur, then actually you will tend to see that if you compare with this one, there's even an increase in sulfur content. Okay, so how we can uh, kind of explain all this? Oh yeah, so that's the, what I just said. So let's try to do a modeling approach. So I will take just a sample, which is to be representative of high pressure serpentinides in terms of ferric iron content and in terms of sulfur content as well, and see uh, what happened. So uh, the next few slides is gonna be a bit uh, kind of uh, demanding. So I will try to simplify from the, from the beginning. We have here uh, in the vertical axis, uh, temperature pressure. So this is our thermal gradient which is kind of um, typical for, for rocks like what we see in the Alps from Almireth and from other localities. And in the horizontal axis, we have the oxygen, which is in the rock in units of mole per kilo. So our starting rock will be something like here. And if the system is close to oxygen, we should follow a vertical path. And in the background, you will see some colors. These colors are actually the oxygen fugacity conditions that we mentioned earlier. And we see that we go from relatively low oxygen fugacity, that you might already know from serpentinization, that can reach very low values. But then, at the condition of the serpentinization, which is something around 650, there is a big jump in oxygen fugacity. Maybe there's no reason to, to kind of, and I mean, to justify why there is a jump in the in the oxygen focusing the condition because this is a result of the model. But if you want to have a kind of intuitive uh, explanation, is because the ferropanesium phases, olivine and autopyroxene, have an XMG which is typically much lower than the reactant antigoride. So if you want to balance the oxygen, uh, you need to kind of have some extra ferrous iron, and this ferrous iron can come from the magnetite. And by doing this, you actually produce hematite. So by, by doing this uh, jump, we make a strong shift in the oxygen fugacity from relatively low values to values that can reach up to three uh, units, log units above the QFM buffer. But then you can also imagine that you can have the system open to oxygen which might be at first strange, but it's something which is actually possible. And what before uh, I forgot to mention, I, I will call this uh, intrinsic deserpentinization to reflect that the system was closed. And uh, to oppose to the term modulated deserpentinization where during the serpentinization, we allowed the system to open for oxygen. And from now, I will try to explain what will happen and this is the and this is the case. This has very important implications because oxygen fugacity will control all multivalent elements uh, in the rock. So you will see that all these curves actually controlling the sulfate, the total sulfur, carbon, ferric iron over total iron, all these species which are sensitive to redox conditions will be affected by this. Uh, so again if you follow up vertical path, your ferric iron total content will remain approximately constant. But of course, if you displace the, your oxygen bulk composition, then you will start to change the ferric iron. So if you do the game of an intrinsic deserpentinization and you plot what are the expectations for the XMG number on olivine autopyroxene, 
uh, your sulfur content in your rock, the carbon and the oxygen fugacity conditions, actually, you will see which is nothing to do with what we see in the field. Uh, rocks from the Almireth have typically an XMG number which is significantly much lower than 95, it's something around 90 here. The sulfur content, it doesn't go to zero because we still see some sulfur in our rock. And the oxygen fugacity conditions that we can constrain by other means, uh, everything but four in nature. So, although this is the prediction, and indeed we can see this in some experiments which are designed to preserve extremely high oxidation conditions, this is not what we see in the case of Almireth. So what we see in nature is that the path is at least partially reversible, so we have some reduction during dehydration, but the intrinsic case is still possible. So because it's still possible, we can kind of try to extrapolate what will happen if we have intrinsic desulfentinization all over the world. This is, can be done using the thermal models from Syracuse, Van Keken and others. So we can, in this PT diagram, plot the conditions, which are here in yellow, where the subduction slabs will cross the dehydration of serpentinite, you can already guess, is this one here. So this is the dehydration of serpentinite, and in the background you have the oxygen fugacity conditions, and you will see that it's a quite high uh, oxygen fugacity going from nearly four to nearly three, or yeah, nearly three log units above the QFM. You can do this again all over the world, and you, when you compare your values, which are again around three, these ones are extremely higher compared to what would be the oxygen fugacity conditions for the background mantle wedge conditions, which are normally around minus, minus one. So when you do this kind of calculation, you can also calculate with the new models what would be the species which can oxidize the mantle wedge, and it's turn out that the most uh, common one is the sulfate. You can have around 40 millimoles of sulfate per kilo of, of fluid, and you can extrapolate this value somehow in an efficiency of the rate of oxidation of the mantle wedge. And this is what I'm plotting here. Here I'm plotting uh, in color will be, again, the oxygen fugacity condition that we said it was something around three, and the size of the, of the symbol reflects how much uh, we can actually oxidize in terms of mass per, per year. And you will see that if we integrate all these values, we get a value which is something around two uh, uh, cubic uh, kilometers square per year, which is lower than we expected at the beginning for the rates that are currently estimated for oxidation of the mantle wedge. So if you summarize, this will be the intrinsic serpentinization model. We have a closed system where serpentinite dehydrates here. It produces fluids with a relatively low uh, value of sulfates. And the reason of this low value is because just the protoleaf already had a low value of sulfur. The ferric over total iron remains the same as the serpentinite, around 0 0.6, 0 0.5. And the capacity to oxidize the mantle wedge here is around two uh, cubic kilometers square per year, and it will increase the oxygen fugacity of the mantle wedge up to 1.5, 1.7. Okay, so that would be the case of intrinsic, but we said that in nature we've seen something different. So now the trick is to model what will happen if the system is open here during the dehydration of serpentina to an external fluid. Now we can do this with uh, perplex and combines the deep earth water model with free energy minimization. And if we do in this, uh, we can infiltrate our serpentinite just here with fluids coming from outside. So the option, if we know that we need to reduce the system, is that the fluid must be reduced. So in this case, we selected a fluid coming from a graphite wearing uh, metapelite. Metapelite, metapelite, metapelite actually uh, very, very abundant around the, this locality. So it's, it would be not surprising that these rocks uh, have seen this kind of fluids. So if we're doing this, now we can calculate again what will be the evolution of the ferric over the total iron. And in this case, it's now decreasing. So we're going from our original 0.5 to this, which is around 0.2 or even lower. So in vertical, you have what would be the um, observed uh, ferric iron content for our prograde uh, chloride as we guide. 
We see also the XMG number of the olivine, which start being high, then decrease during the infiltration towards Bali around 90, which is also the one that we observe in these rocks. And when we compute the oxygen focused conditions, we see that we go from the originally very high 3.5 to value that goes around 2.5. In case of sulfur, this model is also able to reproduce that we increase the sulfur content in the residue. So the magic is there. So by doing this kind of infiltration, we are able to model with these blue lines what will be the evolution of the serpentinides when they dehydrate, which is completely different from what will happen in a irreversible dehydration path, which is the intrinsic the serpentinization that we produce a constant ferric iron content and an extremely decrease in the sulfur content. Okay, so now we are happy with this. We can extrapolate. Ah, I forgot to say that the model is not just reproducing the ferric iron, the sulfur carbon, but also the magnetite content. So the magnetite content is expected to decrease during the infiltration from a reduced fluid coming from the metapilite, which is also in agreement with, with the observations. Okay, so now another we can do the same. Minutes. Yep. Uh, say it again, Lisa. You have another five minutes. Just five minutes. Yes, I think I can. I can do it. <laughs> so we can play the same the same game and compute what would be the efficiency of this fluid that being being interacted with the reduced fluid from the metapilites. And what we see again that we reduce the oxygen fugacity conditions around two point five all over the world. And this will have a, an impact also in the solubility of the sulfates that can be either the same in hot uh, subduction zones or be significantly reduced in very cold subduction zones. And if you sum up all the contributions, we see that the total contribution from fluids that are being modulated is significantly decreased to around 0.8. And notice again that there is no much change in the oxygen fugacity. The, all the symbols are still kind of red because we are in the order of 2.5. Okay, so this will be our case for serpentinized. And I have to thanks here Samuel, I think, uh, because this, I got inspired by your, by your paper in 2012 about these structures. So I imagine that you can have in, a big interaction with fluids from the well, graphite bearing meta sediments that can significantly modify the potential of this fluid to oxidize the mantle wedge. So we have seen the, what will happen with reduced fluids. So now the most logical thing will be to see what will happen with the oxidized case. And there's a large variety of, of sediments now that have been subducted. So I will use as a reference the gloss, which is the average uh, subducting sediment. And if we take this, uh, what we see is that there's no change in the oxygen fugacity of the fluid, but it's a significantly increase in the sulfate content that can be double or even multiplied by three. So by doing this again at the global scale, we see that the symbol is still highly oxidized in terms of oxygen fugacity, but the size, which is reflecting this oxidation capacity, significantly increase up to 3.5. And this will end up with our last model where fluids from oxidized sediments interact with dehydration, dehydrating fluids. And I don't want to go into the details, but the model is also able to reproduce the oxygen fugacity conditions in the slab, sorry, in the mantle wedge which have some record from high pressure uh, rocks from some subduction zones environment. So to summarize, I think oh, I'll try to convince you that there's no contradiction indeed between experiments, modeling, and other observation. It's just a matter of how open was the system in the different cases. The intrinsic despentinization is indeed actually high, was equilibrated high oxygen fugacities, but because of a low sulfur content as a low capacity to oxidize the mantle wedge. In contrast, if we allow the system to be uh, infiltrated by sulfur bearing fluid from gloss like sediments, this can be boost the oxidation rate of the, of the mantle wedge up to 3.5. I didn't show, but if we do it with, uh, with using the alto oceanic crust, this can even multiply by a factor of three. So it's still a large uh, window to, to provide this oxidation. So I think serpentinization is actually is a perfect blend because it produces fluid at high oxygen fugacities, 
And if you allow this fluid to interact with oligothologies that contain sulfur, they will make the strong capacity to oxidize the mantle wedge. So I think it's uh, all I wanted to say, and uh, I'm happy for questions or, or at the end. So, um, hello everyone. Thanks for giving me this chance to present these uh, thoughts and results that we got, preliminary results about uh, how the fluids are moving in uh, the continent environments. Uh, so, as you know, uh, there's a lot of serpentinite in the deep subduction interface, deeper than the, the region where uh, the seismogenic zone is located, and this is mostly related to a fluid transfer across the interface and partial serpentinization of the of the mantle wedge as a consequence of fluid release due to prograde uh, dehydration reactions. So there are a couple of statements that uh, I think are more or less accepted by the community that I, that I'm going to present. Uh, in this long introductory part of my talk. First, um, I think it's quite agreed that the subduction interface region is saturated with moving fluids. And this is well known as, for instance, uh, shown by the high VPVS ratio that are known for the plate interface region, uh, for instance, in Japan. But for some subduction zone, uh, geophysical study have proposed that there exists some extremely narrow, perhaps 50 meters wide interface parallel shear zone, uh, where you can have VPVS as high as 2.2 and perhaps even higher. And this really questions, what is the, the host of uh, this type of uh, environment and the potential high pore fluid pressure? So there is a wide amount of tools that we can use, including tomographic, but also electromagnetic studies, as for instance, you can see in this uh, case study in the, in the cascades. Um, this is nicely showing the distribution of, um, let's say, uh, domains with greater electrical conductivity, which is mostly related to the impregnation of melt material across uh, the, 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 the great mantle. But so far, there is no very clear relation between domains where you have high VPVS areas and uh, clusters of seismicity. So the, this does not seem to be a very simple and straightforward relationship. Second, um, it seems that rock anisotropy has a key importance on petrophysical properties, as this is known thanks to experimental works, as for instance, uh, it has been proposed in the work from Wang and collaborators that were, it has been shown that Crack and isotropy and high pore fluid pressure can critically increase the VPVS ratio and perhaps uh, make it as high as 2.2, which was the value that was proposed by some geophysical studies. So clearly, crack and isotropy and high pore fluid pressure uh, that maintain the crack open may play a key role in explaining this value. Also, some uh, permeability experiments have been demonstrating that there was a substantial permeability and isotropy with uh, the one that is forming as a consequence of shearing on this laptop that would create a significantly higher flow parallel to the plate interface rather than across the plate interface. As you all know, that serpentinite is a strongly foliated uh, material. So uh, one good question, at which time scales are we talking about? Um, the permeability of serpentinite might be substantially different, uh, whether you look at the experimental timescales, at the seismic timescales, or at geological timescales. And this might be indeed a consequence of uh, fast slip movements along the deep interface. I'm going back to this uh, at a later stage in this talk. So uh, it is very critical to understand the feedbacks between fluid transport dynamics and petrophysical properties. So there are some geophysical studies that state that the deep plate interface is sealed above the mohole, which is maintaining high pore fluid pressure in the underlying under crust. And uh, 
they state that the interface uh, below the Moho should be kind of permeable, enabling to decrease this pore fluid pressure. But this is notwithstanding with the presence of potential seals in the form of antigoride schist or chloride schist, as it has been demonstrated using experimental work, that they have uh, a substantial, substantially strong capping effects and perhaps enabling maintaining very high profit pressure below them as a reaction uh, of um, as a metasomatic reaction on the slab top. Also, there has been some study that have shown that as the downgoing plate dehydrates and most notably antigoride that release a lot of fluid, uh, the fluid pollution rate could be faster than the relaxation time of the rock. And thus you could favor brittle behavior of your rock. But you could also, in theory, generate some sort of uh, solitary waves or porosity wave that could travel somewhere in the deep interface region. And indeed, uh, there are geophysical studies in Mexico that have proposed that the response of um, the interface to the production of low frequency earthquake at about 40 to 50 kilometers depth and the subsequent slow slip event, which is triggered afterwards, could be the consequence of a solitary or pore fluid pressure events like waves that are traveling parallel to the plate interface, feeding the, the bottom part of the slow slip region and perhaps traveling as fast as one kilometer per day. So one may wonder, uh, in which material these pulses are traveling in? Are we talking about this mixed subduction channel uh, in the broad sense, or are we above the plate interface? This is something that you cannot resolve at the moment using geophysical tools. But the observation is here, and one has to uh, figure out what it could be related with. So for most subduction zone condition, uh, it is widely agreed that saponite constitute a relatively weak material that would gently flow at relatively low stress levels, as has been proposed and shown in the review paper by Reinhardt and experimentally demonstrated by Gask. Uh, this plastic deformation is the consequence of various phenomena. Perhaps locally, you can have shear bands leading to the strong crystal preferred orientation of the fabrics. But also there is certainly several other mechanisms like pressure solution creep and sliding along crystal facets that can also contribute to this apparent uh, plastic behavior of serpentine. So this is not a big, big news. What's more interesting is the increasing amount of studies that propose that under specific condition, serpentine material at high pressure may become brittle. And this could be related, for instance, to shear zone acceleration enhanced pore fluid pressure, stress transfer. Uh, there are plenty of phenomena that could play jointly to contribute to this anomalous but brittle behavior. And in fact, uh, we do have natural occurrence in exhumed rock showing that failure in serpentinites can generate extremely highly localized shearing that locally leads to uh, melting in the form of nanogranular olivine that has been reported, for instance, in New Zealand, even though this is not a subduction context. And most likely, this is a rather late event. But perhaps this is what it should be looking like at the time it forms in a subduction environment. But it gets hardly preserved just because this material is most likely very reactive. And I doubt that it could survive the entire trip back to the surface. Also, in Corsica, there has been reports of complex cross-cutting relationship between pseudotachylites, so uh, partially molten material that is forming some sort of injection and veins, and cataclastic fabric together with plastic flow that are much mutually cross-cutting. And in the polar urals, I have found a locality with brachiated dunite and that host between the class some sort of a finely brachiated material with locally some antigoride bearing spherulitic-like uh, shapes of crystal that may point to the presence of a former melt, but this needs to be further investigated. 
So I'm going to show you a couple of examples in the next few slides, uh, just to give you a field insight of what we can tell about fluid mobility in uh, serpentinides from exhumed subduction complexes. And this is one example at the base of the Dambanche, where you nicely show uh, how mixing and hybridization occurs at the contact between the upper plate, uh, constituted by intrusive rocks, and the, the lower plate, which is the schistless ring. And then you have a zone where you have blocks and extensive growth of tal chloride in a serpentinite environment. And this is the consequence of uh, the juxtaposition of continental material and oceanic material. And you have a lot of evidence for fluid percolation and mobility of various elements, as I'm going to show you in the next slide. This is in the hybridized, hybridized domain, uh, just in the contact, where you can see some spectacular dolom dolomite-rich channels that are uh, infiltrating through the, the, the rock volume. But also, you can notice the presence of cracks in the foliated serpentinites that are strongly evoking uh, the presence of hydrofractures and that are also composed of uh, carbonates. So these two examples clearly point to the presence of uh, a CO2 compound in the fluid phase, even though um, the, the mechanism by which this channel occur uh, remains to be better understood. Another example from southern Iran uh, lies in the Zagros uh, suture belt, where you have a spectacular Marianas-like support in a channel where, that, where you can see several tens of meters long blue blocks that float wrapped in an antigorite schist matrix. And uh, well, this is what the, the, the exposure is looking like, where you see these blocks are nicely stretched towards the north and wrapped within the serpentinite rich environment. This is a picture of one of the blue blocks hosted by serpentinite, which is wrapping around. And as you can see, the block is internally foliated. But interestingly, we found plenty of aragonite burn fractures within these blocks. And most of the fractures you see in the blocks, they display abundant evidence for oscillatory pattern in, in most minerals. So this is pointing to a periodic fluid uh, rock interaction events that are contributing to the growth of these uh, various um, vein generations. So we have been proposing, based on extensive field observation and geochemical study, that these rocks, these bluish blocks, they record uh, some sort of fluid pulses that are passing along the plate interface, traveling parallel to it. Uh, we also have to admit that these fluids were externally produced and uh, they reflect infiltration and explosion of the block as they are reacting with it, perhaps in the shape of pulses that are contributing to the final structure as we see it in the, as we see it in the field. Um, what we don't know from the field record, and this is where collaboration with other studies is critical, is the duration and the velocity of these pulses. Um, this is something just we, we just cannot figure out at the moment, just because the speed at which these pulses uh, develop is just not resolvable with the current geochronological techniques. Uh, also, one may wonder what is the trace left by these fluid pulses in the serpentinite matrix. For that point, there are a few things that we can say. Uh, it's surprising how the blocks are fractured, which tells you that there has been fluid coming in and breaking them. But we also see some vein within the host around that also exhibit various cross-cutting relationships and evidence for flow and parallelization with the block rings. And one may wonder, what's the origin of the fluid passing by? Well, um, you see that the entire matrix around this spectacular blue block here has been very finely brecciated, as you can see, and the interclast has been filled by various types of carbonates, including aragonite, including dolomite. And in some localities, some of these sheared uh, breccia have been uh, ductilely deformed, as you can see on this picture. We know from uh, in situ uh, isotopic characterization that these veins have the same signature as the host, 
which is pointing to a full uh, geochemical homogenization of the, of the volume of the rock. And the structures tell you that there are switches between brittle creep and ductile flow, but with no evidence of obvious localized slip. I'm talking about pseudotachylite that have been extensively searching. Perhaps this massive uh, rupture of the entire serpentinite around the block uh, just prevented localized slip to, to, to occur in, in that specific case. But we're going to see that there are some interesting features afterwards. Uh, at, at a smaller scale, in the thin section scale, you can see various events of hydrofracturing and vein filling. Um, so this is again pointing to the presence of a CO2 phase in the infiltrating fluids. And this CO2 seems to be a very reactive compound uh, in the serpentinite material. So it's very good for sequestrating uh, CO2, as, uh, as you may know. What we don't know, in fact, regarding the, the, the mechanical behavior of the host around these blocks is uh, whether it's an increase in strain rate or an increase in pore fluid pressure or a combination of both that enable the switch from, let's say, a normal plastic behavior to uh, this um, astonishing brittle, uh, brittle fascia. Now, whether this is um, widespread or not, this is something that we, we don't know, but this is not widely documented in nature. One of these blocks, interestingly, has, to, has shown the presence of a long fault zone, which is several meters thick, and that hosts evidence for foliated cataclasite, so potentially pseudotachylite, cross-cutting abrasions. So clearly, there's been an evidence of faulting during exhumation, perhaps around 0.8 GPA and 250 degrees on the way back. But what's interesting here is that we're watching uh, an event that was most likely greater than the size of the block, which means that we are watching the propagation of a fault that was embedded within the serpentinites and that just propagated and cut the block, the mafic block into two pieces. And this is not fully obvious uh, as a first guess, uh, most people would say that a fault would just disappear, vanish uh, within a fully serpentinized environment. In that case, we have a, a clear evidence that uh, locally, under specific conditions, a fault can propagate and cut a block as stiff as a blue schist fragment. So is it an analog of some of the moderate magnitude seismicity, which is currently reported in the Mariana subduction zone? That's a question that one, one may ask. Okay, the last field example I wanted to show you today uh, is in the well-known Monviso Massif, where you have a stack of sliver that went down to 80 kilometers depth. And I'm focusing today at the bottom of this uh, gabbro body, which is in yellow here, and at the contact with the serpentinite sole, which is at the bottom. And there you have the lower shear zone, when you find not only small amount of calcis, but also a spectacular rounded eclogite facies block that are wrapped by uh, an assemblage of uh, serpentinite, uh, sheared serpentinite, chloride schist, and talc schist. And interestingly, at the contact with the block, so this is right, the contact, uh, the rim of the block, you see some of acetite paragenesis forming. And uh, you also locally form some little garnet. And these little garnet, they have the peculiarity of uh, exhibiting very strong oscillatory behavior in chromium, as you can see here. And this oscillation is not only visible uh, in the garnet, but also in the facetite matrix as well. So um, this is a very interesting example that is documented uh, potentially a sequence of free drop interaction events. The fluids were most likely derived from the serpentinite, but there are also evidence for contribution from uh, sediments or altered oceanic crust. And they've been continuously wetting the block surface and potentially bringing some chromium to the system. And the chromium was incorporated in the crystal surface uh, at every pulse of fluid that was passing through the rock volume. So, um, we know that the metasomatism occurs at about 75 kilometers depth. 
we know that you need a dramatic amount of fluids to trigger such massive fluid rock interaction event in the shear zone. Uh, this just cannot be the local dehydration of the serpentinite as documented in the serpentinite soil here by Gilio, for instance. This would not create no enough material. Just take an example in the Zermatsa zone, there is plenty of olivine veins like this, but we never see a, a spectacular example of metasomatism as visible in the lower shear zone. So there must be, have, there must have been another source of fluid. Uh, and I believe that antigorite breakdown, which occurs much deeper, would have been a, an interesting uh, candidate. So this, that means transportation of large amount of fluid over great distances, perhaps several tens of kilometers. And on the way, it can get enriched as it reacts with sediments, for instance, and it can get uh, enriched in sulfur, and then you're gonna see some abundant pyrite precipitation forming at the contact between the serpentinite uh, and the mafic block. But the key question here is, what are the fluid pathways that enable the transportation of such amount of fluids uh, over such great distances? Do we see any trace of this massive flow in the lower shear zone serpentinite? The answer is no, so far. Uh, we know that there's been a geochemical perturbation of the signal in, in, the, in the lower shear zone, uh, but perhaps due to retrogression, because this shear zone has been admittedly slightly retrogressed upon exhumation, uh, maybe we lost the, the track of uh, potential seismic instability that would have contributed to increase the large scale permeability and channelize this fluid over such great distances. So, um, so, so uh, just um, uh, you have another five minutes. Yeah, that's fine. I'm over. Uh, some words of uh, discussion and perhaps uh, thought for research perspective. From this field observation and this petrol geochemical characterization, it seems that serpentinites appear perhaps more brittle and permeable as uh, previously thought. And perhaps there are some the propagation of seismic events along the plate interface that can transiently contribute to locally increase the permeability and thus enable to transfer over relatively short time scales substantial amount of fluids like a fold valve uh, mechanism if, if you want in a way. So what we need to better address this issue and, and better quantify this cryptic phenomenon which is very difficult to decipher uh, I guess that uh, the future will come uh, in the future. The future answer will come from laboratory experiments on the microphysics of antigorite deformation. I'm thinking about perhaps fluctuating uh, the porphyrite pressure and evaluate what's the effect on uh, VPVS on the the deformation pattern, the the the, the, the microphysical processes in a way. Uh, also, there will be some interesting information to come using modeling approach, in particular, uh, the, the recent implementation of poroelasticity in the viscoelastoplastic models, as for instance, used in the last uh, versions of the code from, uh, from Taras Gheria and collaborators. We need also to improve the resolution of uh, geophysical studies. I'm talking about uh, high resolution relocation of uh, of the ruptures uh, to answer key questions such as are slow sleep even hosted by the serpentinites? And uh, another key question would be what is the answer of the fluid poisson, uh, of the poisson ratio of the rock as a consequence of the seismic cycle? Do we know that uh, the plate interface can react and exhibit different poisson ratio as a function of? whether you are in the interseismic stage or in the post-seismic stage. Do, will we have one day the capability of monitoring uh, Poisson's ratio fluctuation in a serpentinized environment? That would be a really neat uh, progress. And last, uh, I, my talk was intended to show you that we need further field and petrogeochemical observation in serpentinides, but not only. Sometimes the serpentinides, they just cannot talk. And there you have to use the neighboring rocks, such as the blue schist or the eclogites, where whatever phase which is resilient enough to record some sort of 
present history in it. And uh, the techniques that should be used, well, it's uh, high resolution imaging of microstructures. We're going to need uh, further high resolution geochemical tracers and perhaps some isotopic mapping of fault zone that would be also very nice. And last, uh, and perhaps the most challenging is to get age constraint on the timing of metasomatic and fluid rock interaction events. So I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I hope you can have an interesting discussion after that. Thank you.